Good morning, everybody. It is January 17th, 2023, and we are starting our council session with uh, uh, a wonderful proclamation celebrating the Lunar New Year. So I know that County Executive Elrich is here, and so I'll be joining him, uh, and Council Member Mink is virtually. So let's, let's come on down. And I know that we have a lot of folks here from the Asian American Pacific Islander community as well. So if you want to join us all down in the well, so we can celebrate. So we stay here. And then we can go down to the picture. Yeah. Down here, yes. Good morning. Hi, here, come on in. We're amongst friends this morning. Okay, come on, slide in, slide in. Okay, well it is, a, yes, absolutely, come on up, come on up. Uh, so uh, I am really excited to be here with everybody this morning celebrating the Lunar New Year. Uh, and I know that there is traditionally agreement on what the years stand for, uh, but this year, it is either the year of the cat if you are of Vietnamese descent or the year of the rabbit if you are uh, in many of the other nations that are celebrating. Uh, and I, I just want to say that this is one of my favorite special times of the year, uh, seeing that beautiful cultural diversity that we have, uh, seeing the song and the dance that is performed all throughout our, our county, uh, and then also enjoying some really good food too. Uh, but what I want to do right now is turn it over to Council Member Mink, who is feeling a little under the weather, so she's joining us virtually. But this is an incredibly important proclamation for all of us here at the Council, as Council Member Mink is our very first Asian American Pacific Islander member of the Council, which is an awesome, awesome thing. So Council Member Mink, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and thank you so much to everyone who is here today uh, joining us for this exciting occasion. You know, I was, I was all ready to say that I'm so glad to be back in person with all of you, but here I am. <laughs> but I'm very glad that you all could be there in person to celebrate. What a fantastic day, a fantastic, joyful occasion. I am absolutely honored to be able to say that I am the first AAPI council member to be able to present this Lunar New Year proclamation. And, uh, and, and I really appreciate uh, the council president and County Executive um, Elridge for putting this, helping us put this together uh, and to all of my colleagues on, on the council for, for always uh, coming together to, to celebrate this wonderful day. Um, the AAPI community is you know the fastest growing community in our county we are an enormous part of what makes montgomery county special all of you have contributed so much to the community um, to help keep us going through this pandemic but well before that and continuing well out of this um, cultural contributions economic contributions taking care of the physical mental emotional and social health of our community uh, as I have begun my, my young journey on the council, I have gotten to meet many of you already, tour your facilities, um, meet many of the residents who you serve, and I have just been absolutely blown away by everything that you all have been doing, and, uh, and I'm just so grateful. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, uh, pass it over. Should I should I go ahead and, and move into the reading of the proclamation? Well, let's first have uh, uh, County Executive Elridge make some comments and then some members of the community. Wonderful, thank you. So, so Kristen, thank you for um, bringing this proclamation forward and thank everybody for being here today. Uh, we have an amazing Asian community in the United States. And I know I sat down with representatives of the South Korean embassy and their comment to us was their people like to come here and people like to do business here because they feel safe and welcome here. And it's nice to know that even at the embassy level, there's a sense that this is a county where people can feel safe and, and welcome. And I, you, you play such a big role in our county, whether it's in you know, 
whether it's the restaurant industry or the retail industries or life sciences or engineering, you are present in every aspect of life in Montgomery County. Um, you, you have many highly educated people making major advances in life sciences. This is not a small thing. I've had the ability to go to many of the different businesses in the county. And I just want you to know that we really do appreciate what you do. I also, and I know I'm speaking for everybody on the council as well, when you experienced those first incidents of hate, we reacted really quickly and we wanted to reassure people that we'll always be there to protect you and help make sure that you're safe in Montgomery County. We want everyone to feel that if you're here, this is a place where you're going to be safe. And I know that it was disheartening and unfortunately we had a president who encouraged that kind of lunacy, but he's gone, we're still here. And, and we look forward to making sure that, you know, we do our job to work with you to make sure you want to be here. You are our best amb ambassadors. When we think about we will do it like a trip to China and Korea in the future, that it's the people you know and the relationships you have that kind of pave the way for a lot of the work we want to do. So thank you so much for everything. I look forward to continuing to work with you. And uh, it's just great to see all of you here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, County Executive Elrich. Uh, now, want to bring up a pillar of the AAPI community and our legal community here uh, in in Montgomery County in the region. Judge Pac, come on up. Uh, thank you. My job is to uh, introduce the, our top leaders uh, from AAPI community. Uh, they are real pillars of uh, Montgomery County, and they serve a, a lot uh, to the people who are in need, and they are making huge difference in Montgomery County, and they are here to celebrate uh, Asian Lunar New Year, and we want to thank uh, Council Member uh, Mink for presenting uh, proclamation joint proclamation today with the county executive, Mark Edwidge, who has all, always been the uh, supporter of the AAPI community, and also uh, Council President Evan Grass, who also been supportive of our community for years. And we are very grateful for their support for our community. And with that, I'm going to quickly introduce the uh, people uh, in that particular order. Uh, Ms. Queen Gong, uh, pick your hand up, and the uh, uh, An Nguyen from the Vietnamese American Service, uh, Jay Sun from CCCAA, and the uh, Niping, Dr. Niping Feng from the uh, uh, Health Initiative, uh, Karina Ho from the uh, Chinese American Chamber of Commerce, and the uh, Dr. Ping Lu from the uh, Chinese Alumni Associations, and uh, Mr. Yong Ah Kim from the Montgomery County Korean American Association, uh, Dr. Hyun Suk Choi from the uh, Korean American Association of the State of Maryland, uh, Lily Zhang, uh, former president of the uh, Union of Chinese Professional Associations, and Dr. Min Lee. Uh, former president of the uh, Chinese Alumni Association, and uh, Reverend uh, Kim, yeah, Levin Zhang from the uh, uh, Montgomery County Korean American Association, and uh, Dr. Kwang Lee from the Korean American Association, uh, Senior Citizens Association of Maryland, uh, uh, George Dang from the uh, uh, Asia Links, and Dr. Chi Sang Lee from CCACC, and uh, Mr. Sung Woo from the uh, CBA. CBA, and Mr. Hong Deng, former president of uh, Maryland Vietnamese Mutual Association, now treasurer. He has the money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Al Bui, uh, Executive Director of uh, Maryland Vietnamese Mutual Association, and Elena Lee, uh, Vice President of the uh, Federation of Korean American Associations. 
And I think these are the older leaders who are here today to celebrate uh, Lunar New Year. I also want to uh, recognize Cal uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin's office is here, so thank you to his staff for, for joining us. Uh, and then also just want to uh, express regrets that have been conveyed to me uh, by State Senator Susan Lee, by Delegate Lily Chi, and also Delegate David Moon, who are busy working in Annapolis, but would have otherwise liked to have been here. Um, and with that, we're going to read the proclamation, but I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Mink to do the honors of reading the whole thing. All righty. This is so beautiful. This is just a wonderful celebration of not just the diversity of our county, but the diversity within the AAPI community. Thank you all so much for being here. This is just wonderful. Without further ado, whereas the Lunar New Year is a source of pride for the county's Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, East and Southeast Asian communities, and an educational opportunity for neighbors to learn about Asian cultures and Whereas Lunar New Year brings families together to uphold the traditions of honoring elders, celebrating culture, deepening family bonds, and welcoming the new year with good wishes. And whereas festivities across the county will showcase the richness of Asian culture and highlight the importance of family togetherness. And whereas January 22nd, 2023 marks the beginning of the Lunar New Year in many Asian communities, now, therefore, be it resolved that County Executive Mark Elrich, Council President Evan Glass, Council Member Kristen Mink, and the full Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby celebrate Lunar New Year in Montgomery County and recognize the contributions that Asian Americans make to our community. Yay. If all my colleagues would like to come on down, and we have proclamations here for everybody who's participating. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to mention uh, one leader, uh, 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 Linda Han from the Global Han in Hyundai, uh, one of the top leaders from the Korean American community. I forgot to mention her. And I want to thank council, all the council members here today, uh, including uh, council member Sidney Kess, uh, council members too, and the uh, Avanas. Uh, who had worked with us in the past.
That was a lot of fun, and thank you, Councilmember Mink, for joining us virtually. I hope you uh, have a speedy recovery. Um, we are ahead of schedule, so we can keep the Lunar New Year celebration going for 12 minutes while we go into recess until 10.30.
Okay, if we can get a countdown. We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good morning, everybody. It's Tuesday, January 17th, and we are back at the County Council of Montgomery County, and we're now going to move to general business. Madam Clerk, are there any announcements? Good morning, Council President, Council Vice President, Council Members. We have one announcement today on the consent calendar, which is item number five. We have deleted item B, introduction, resolution to recognize the exiled Kashmiri Pandit refugee and asylee population in Montgomery County, Maryland on January 19th, 2023. And uh, no petitions were received from um, by the Council this week. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And the Clerk has circulated the minutes for October 3rd and 10, October 3rd, October 10, November 1st, November 15th, the 28th and 29th of November, December 6th and the 13th, um, and the closed session meeting from October 11th and November 15th, all in 2022 for approval. Are there any changes? I'm not hearing any, those are approved. And now we will move on to legislative session day number two. Introduction of bills. Bill 1-23, a property tax credit, elderly individuals and retired military service members with amendments. The lead sponsor is Council Member Katz and the co-sponsors are Council Members Balcom, Ludke, Friedson, Fani Gonzalez and Albernaz. I will turn it over to Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And for those who are not co-sponsors, don't worry, we can add you as well. So uh, there's always room for, for additions. And first off, as we begin, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Soconi for providing such a thorough packet. It, uh, she's done, as always, a terrific job. The purpose of the bill is to increase the home assessment thresholds for exemptions for seniors and retired members of the military the home assessment thresholds for seniors who have lived in their homes for 40 years, and this has not changed since 2016, and we had to follow state law. There's, there's all these uh, rules that we had to follow. Well, it would, by this legislation, increase by $50,000 from $650,000 to $700,000 for something that is, for a home that is eligible, and the threshold for military would increase from $500,000, retired military from uh, 500,000 to uh, 550. The public hearing is scheduled at 1.30 on Tuesday, February 7th. The GO committee, I guess, is tentatively scheduled for Thursday, February 16th. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Katz. Uh, Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Councilmember Katz, for introducing this bill, and I'm proud to support this effort as a co-sponsor. And as we now find ourselves in, in year two of a multi-year uh, reassessment for our property values, it's more critical than ever that we take measures uh, to make sure we're protecting our residents so that they are able to remain our residents and age in place appropriately. Um, and that we have had a significant increase in our property values as a whole, which is not a bad thing, um, but, but that it can also mean other consequences in terms of if you're not willing to sell or you're not ready to sell and you do want to remain in your home, if your assessments are going up, making the cost of living and remaining where you are uh, significant and a barrier. So thank you for doing that, um, and I'm proud to support this measure. It's a small step, but it's a, a, a very positive step. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Friedson. Uh, thank you very much. I'll echo those comments. Thank you to Councilmember Katz for your leadership on this issue, your continued efforts to recognize the realities facing many of our older adults that are growing as a population uh, in Montgomery County that we need to make sure that we're continuing our efforts to help residents to age in place uh, in our communities uh, and to, uh, as we continue our efforts to uh, help residents to, to move here and to locate here. We want to help them stay here uh, as well and continue to be uh, productive members of uh, our community. This is just a, a latest effort of that. I did want to note that uh, we had been uh, working on this issue. We, we had asked OLO to do a comparative analysis of senior tax credit programs around the region. Uh, we received preliminary results of that work before the holidays and hope to have some more information on that and we'll be delving into it 
uh, in more detail. So I think that will help for this effort and also help for subsequent uh, efforts uh, as well. And just wanted to, to note uh, the, the leadership of uh, my colleague, Councilmember Katz, and uh, really pleased to be a co-sponsor of this effort and look forward to continuing to find ways to help our aging adults uh, in Montgomery County to be able to age in our community. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Uh, appreciate Council Member Katz's uh, leadership here as well as the co-sponsors. I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor. I will say um, I look forward to also working on the bill. I think there's some potential ways to improve it and maybe expand who, who it covers. Uh, but the premise, as we told our Commission on Aging last, last week, is very important. We need to make sure people can age in place and stay in their homes, and this is something that can help folks. So look forward to working it through, but thank you for introducing it, and I'd like to be added. Council Member Fana Gonzalez. Um, thank you so much for introducing the bill, Councilmember Katz, as the wife of a veteran who qualifies under this bill. Actually, by the state, uh, my, hus my husband is a disabled veteran due to service-connected injuries that he suffered, and um, I do feel that more people who served our nation uh, should qualify under this bill. So I look forward to perhaps expanding it. Um, so thank you so much for taking the first step. And I would also like to chime in and thank Councilmember Katz for, for introducing this bill, add myself as a co-sponsor uh, in recognition that we need to look at all tools available to make sure that people are able to uh, remain living in Montgomery County and age in place. So thank you. Anybody else have any other comments? Oh, uh, Councilmember Sales. Okay. Thank you, President Glass. Uh, Thank you, Sydney, for introducing this legislation um, as the daughter of um, an Army veteran and also parents that are seniors and want to successfully age in place. Um, you know, as Councilmember Jawando mentioned, we met with the Office of Aging last week, and so it's important that we show how responsive we are to uh, their needs to live in our county. Um, and have self-sufficiency. Um, what was startling is that 16% um, of our seniors live below the 200% um, of the federal poverty level, and over 84,000 residents age 65 and under do not have health insurance. And so minimizing the monthly cost to maintain a quality of life while you are facing a diminishing income uh, remains important. So. I too would like to be added as a co-sponsor and uh, look forward to working on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Mink. Yeah, uh, thank you so much to Council Member Katz for bringing this bill. <clears throat> I too would like to be added as a co-sponsor. Uh, my, my own parents are, are seniors in District 5. Uh, and, uh, and this was also an issue that I've heard a lot about from residents across the district throughout the campaign season and then continuing since taking office. Um, this, is, this is tremendously important uh, as we have uh, you know, an enormous number of residents who are um, aging across our county and we want to make sure that they are able to, to stay here comfortably. So thank you so much uh, and I look forward to working with you moving forward. Fantastic. Councilmember Stewart. Great. Thank you. Um, I think uh, my joining makes it unanimous then. Um, and so I just want to thank uh, Councilmember Katz. Um, I know this will come before the Government Operations Committee, and I look forward to working with my colleagues who have already expressed um, interest in looking at um, how to expand this. Um, as the mayor in the city of Tacoma Park, I know there were many residents who did avail themselves of this, but there are ways to also um, help expand this so it reaches more people. So thank you, Councilmember Katz. There you go. As Councilmember Stewart noted, that is the first bill introduced in this session that is full support of the Council. So congratulations, Councilmember Katz. Uh, and as has been noted, there will be a public hearing scheduled for this legislation on February 7th at 1.30, and it will go to the GO Committee for scheduled hearing on February 16th. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. So coming had anything to add? <laughs> that was a comprehensive presentation. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you. That's the reason I asked, Ms. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, next item. Uh,
is expedited bill 223, the Board of Investment Trustees membership and amendments. The lead sponsor is the council president at the request of the county executive. Ms. McCartney Green, would you like to explain this legislation? I do, and thank you. Uh, expedited bill 223 uh, would modify the membership of the Board of Investment Trustees by removing the director of human resources and replacing with the chief labor labor relations officer as an ex-official member. Under current county law, the Board of Trustees is required to have four uh, ex-official members that are um, selected by the uh, county executive and appointed by the council. In this case, the, the director of human resources will no longer uh, be responsible for the administration of, um, of bargaining or administration of employment retirement benefits. Instead, the chief labor, labor relations office um, would be. And so the purpose of this bill is to replace the Director of Human Resources with the Chief Labor Relations Office Officer. Public hearing is scheduled for February 7th at 1.30 p.m. Thank you very much for that, Ms. McCartney Green. Not hearing, uh, seeing any comments from my colleagues. As you noted, there is a public hearing for this on February 7th at 1.30, and a GEO committee work session will be scheduled for a later date. So thank you very much. Now we go on to calls for uh, call for bills for final reading, uh, and first item is expedited bill 3222, Department of Health and Human Services Structure and Positions. Uh, Ms. Wellens is joining us. Ms. Wellens, would you like to uh, introduce this? Certainly. Um, thank you, Mr. Council President, and thank you, and good morning, Council Members. Expedited Bill 32-22. Uh, was introduced uh, by the prior council president, Albernos, at the request of the county executive. Um, this bill would do some restructuring with regard to the Department of Health and Human Services and the county's health officer, which, as you know, is both a county and a state position. So that's kind of a, a unique one. Uh, the bill would establish a Chief of Public Health Services as a non-merit position in DHHS, eliminate a vacant position of the Chief Operating Officer as a non-merit position in the Department of Health and Human Services, and um, maybe most critically, the bill would remove the requirement that the County Health Officer also serves as the Chief of the Direct Service Division for Public Services. Um, as you know, the council recently confirmed uh, Dr. Keisha Davis to the position of the county health officer, and the council will be, uh, the executive has appointed and, and the council will be considering the appointment um, and interviewing Dr. James Bridgers uh, to serve as the new chief of public health services, you know, assuming that this bill before you is enacted. There are a few clarifications and a couple of potential amendments for your consideration. Um, just to note that, um, and I should have mentioned previously, Dr. Stoddard is here, should you have any questions for him. Um, so the um, Dr. Stoddard informed us that um, the intent is that the new Chief of Public Health Services will also serve as the Deputy Health Officer. Um, and so one potential clarification for the bill, which is at, um, it's at page four of the staff memorandum, there's a potential amendment to make that clear under the law. It would simply add after line 11 of the bill that the chief of public health services also serves as the deputy health officer, council staff developed the amendment in coordination um, with Dr. Stoddard and the executive branch um, connected to that, so that's a, a potential amendment for you. Connected to that, um, you can see on page three, under item number three of the staff memorandum, uh, the executive has resubmitted to you um, the executive regulation 22-22, um, which sets forth the position description for the new chief of public health, and that would uh, be amended to indicate this duty that, that, the, um, that the Chief of Health Services is also serving as the Deputy Health Officer and also would alter the um, educational requirements to 
uh, more closely mirror those of the health officer. So item number three is for is basically for your information to clarify uh, what's before you in the position description. And those resubmitted regs are at circle 26 of the packet. So you'll be voting on those as part of the consent calendar. But then the bill itself for the so uh, the bill itself, the potential regulation, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the potential amendment to clarify the deputy health officer position, um, again, is at item four um, of the staff memorandum. So, Mr. President, I don't know if you want to consider that amendment. Well, before we move on to any uh, considerations or amendments, let me turn it over to the HHS committee chair, Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Ms. Mullins, for working on this. And thank you, Dr. Stoddard. So just for the benefit of my incoming colleagues, because this is one of those pieces of legislation that crossed over from the previous council to this one. And I know many of you were following, you were among the millions watching at home uh, as we were discussing and deliberating, uh, of course, the county's COVID response. And the, for a little bit more context, this just sort of reflects the reality on the ground. Um, we are so fortunate that Dr. Bridger so ably for over a year and a half served in an acting capacity and really we didn't miss a beat throughout the entire public health process. He and his team continued to work vigorously with all of our public health officials at the local and state and federal level and we are also blessed and fortunate that we have been able to nominate Dr. Keisha Davis as our new public health officer. She brings as we all know a wealth of unbelievable talent but the practical reality was the reason that the position, among some reasons, that the position had been, uh, we were unable to fill for over a year and a half was some of the feedback we had received from some of the people interested in the position was that the scope was too big. And that to be effective both as a public health officer while also managing the day-to-day -day operations of a critical function within our Department of Health and Human Services was probably too big of a bite of the apple. And so while we are the only jurisdiction in the state that does require a medical degree of our public health officer, the feeling was that by splitting the two positions, we would be able to achieve um, both the operational needs of the Department of Health and Human Services, while also being more competitive in our recruitment of a public health officer. And I think the proof is in the pudding. We were able to succeed in that regard. So. Um, while Ms. Wellens uh, described procedurally what we'll have to do to go through and enact this change, I'll also note just uh, before yielding back to Council President Glass is that uh, in practice the department has been doing this for, for several months now uh, and doing it very effectively. And Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Davis have already hit the ground running and have forged a very strong uh, professional working relationship building off of the successes we've had as a community and the lessons learned these last two years in particular. So I uh, just wanted to provide that context. Thank you for breaking that down, Mr. Chair. Um, a lot of different moving parts, as, as Ms. Wallens also noted, uh, not only with this item, but with future items uh, in the consent calendar. Uh, turn it over to Councilmember Sales for comment. Um, thank you, uh, President Glass, and thank you uh, Gabe for the overview. I just had a few questions about um, how will the two roles um... Dr. Stoddard yes. come on down. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Um, so I was just wondering how will the two roles um, interact with each other and you could tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So I think over the last several years there's been this emphasis on health and all policies, meaning there's a, 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 you want to have a health consideration, health equity consideration in everything the county does. So from Vision Zero and our pedestrian safety to the opioid crisis. And, and so I think the, one of the big important things is within public health services, we have school health services and a number of other health delivery systems. The health officer will provide recommendations across county government on how we should operate and then those will be reflected down in the programs that we deliver both in public health services but across the county as a whole. And so the, the two positions would interface in large part because many of the actions that a health officer may recommend that we do will be enacted through our health delivery services. Not all of them, they'll, they'll go much broader than that, but that would be the, a core way in that they would work together. Obviously, with, with the deputy health officer being chief of public health services, as, as was recommended, uh, then obviously they're going to be working together on a much more regular basis, to, even on those health policy issues as well. 
Okay. Thank you for that. Um, yes. Is um, are is Dr. Bridges or um, Dr. Davis um, thought about how we can improve our public health service delivery so that we're reaching out to more of the communities who need the most support, given that we now have an expanded oversight? I know that uh, Dr. Bridges will be interviewing with you all this afternoon, and I've seen some of the, his responses to questions that were asked, and I know he intends to focus a lot on health equity and delivery, expansion of del direct delivery services to residents who don't regularly receive those services right now. And I know Dr. Davis, um, and I, yeah, obviously when she spoke to you all during her interview and, and subsequently has focused a lot on health equity, uh, we do have a number of systems, and we've learned a lot during the pandemic about um, whether it's food security or other areas where we have a much more expansive need than I think we fully appreciated before the pandemic. It really uh, uh, served as a wake-up call in a lot of ways for some of the needs that already exist in the community, but that either got exacerbated or much more fully elucidated during the pandemic. And so I know that they're keenly aware of the, the gaps that we have in service delivery, where it's uh, often bringing services closer to where people live or improving the coordination with our transportation resources to get people to the service, depending on what the nature is. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of this. I know they're heavily integrated with uh, Dr. Kapoon, the new uh, health officer at MCPS, uh, with the expansion of wellness centers, offering more mental health supports, coordinating across service areas with the behavioral mental health services and health human services. So I know there's gonna be a lot of emphasis is probably gonna be the key focus area of, of uh, uh, certainly their coordination with one another is, is direct delivery services and getting them closer to the residents who have not been able to as readily access them over the last several years. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to um, add that data shows that the Latino community has uh, particularly been affected. And so um, I'm sure public health literacy is going to be um, key in ensuring that we're reaching those communities. So culturally relevant outreach, I hope that's also going to be part of an increased part of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Sales. Uh, Council Member Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. First of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Stoddard, for all of your work and your collaboration. It really has been hugely helpful as we talk about uh, the two positions. Uh, in many ways, I view uh, it as three with, with your help and support and your expertise, which has been a godsend, frankly, uh, to the county. And so I just want to acknowledge and thank you for that. I know all of my colleagues really appreciate your uh, responsiveness and your willingness to, to work with us and work through issues. Uh, and I got to thank Dr. Bridgers for everything that he has done. You know, I think we were saying he's doing two jobs, but he's really been doing three or more jobs for uh, the last year and a half. And uh, he has been a really uh, collaborative leader in the county, uh, has really brought a great deal of expertise. And I, I personally really appreciate uh, the manner in which he's gone about his work. And I'm really excited to have Dr. Davis uh, here, who comes with tremendous experience and expertise in the broader issues, specifically in health equity, but also uh, has deep, deep local family roots. And I think that that's important as we talk about uh, serving the county, that local understanding uh, of the communities in, in which we are implementing these policies. Uh, if we're going to dig deeply into them, we have to know them. Uh, and I know that she knows them uh, extremely well. And so I, I think this is really exciting. Um, I have been advocating for this change for a while. So I'm really pleased uh, that we have uh, what appears to be a very strong consensus uh, on it. I think it makes a lot of sense so that we can focus in the areas that uh, matter so that we can make sure that we're putting folks in a position to succeed and ask them to do jobs that are fair, uh, that they actually can uh, be successful and use their expertise uh, to actually move the needle uh, and move the ball forward. So I'm really pleased. I'm looking forward to this. I'm very much looking forward to later uh, on today to uh, interviewing Dr. Bridgers and, 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 and to support him uh, as well. Uh, uh, there are two amendments, uh, one amendment that was in the packet uh, that I'm happy to move if, uh, if, if, if there uh, is an interest uh, and that, uh, I see some nodding. Uh, and then I have an amendment that I sent around uh, to colleagues which would really codify uh, what has uh, been discussed, what has been the longstanding practice. 
Um, there were discussions of whether or not we would change the standard when we weren't thinking about splitting up the positions. Uh, but now that we have decided to split up the positions, uh, this has been the approach that the executive branch uh, has now taken, uh, which I, I appreciate. Uh, and this would, you know, codify what has been the practice previously and what is now going to be uh, the, the practice uh, in the efforts that we're uh, undertaking uh, today. So uh, I'll move both amendments one at a time, if that's appropriate. Which one would you like to move first? Uh, I'll move first with the, the staff uh, recommendation. Uh, this is uh, number two, the potential amendment uh, that you heard uh, from Ms. Wellens earlier. After line 11, insert the following. The Chief of Public Health Services also serves as the Deputy Health Officer. I'll move that now. Is there a second? Uh, moved by Councilmember Friedson, seconded by Councilmember Albernaz. Any conversation? Okay. All those in favor of that amendment, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Uh, the second amendment, I'll move. I uh, sent a memo to colleagues. Appreciate that uh, there's uh, uh, consensus uh, with the executive branch as well. Appreciate Dr. Stoddard your uh, conversations with us and conversations that I had with uh, uh, Councilmember Albernaz as chair of the HHS committee. Uh, that amendment would be after line one, add the following, 2-42, health officer, the county health officer, number one, has the functions assigned by state law, and would add and, number two, must be a licensed physician. I will move that amendment forward now. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Councilmember Friedson, seconded by Councilmember Albernaz. Any conversation? Councilmember Ludke. Yes, I have a, a quick question. So just to make sure I understand, it's that the county health officer has the, fun the functions assigned by state law, but does state law mandate that it must be must be a licensed physician? Just a I'll answer and I'll let uh, uh, Dr. Stoddard and Ms. Wellens uh, chime in. State law requires that either the health officer or the deputy, one of those two has to be a licensed physician. The county has always had the standard that the chief health officer must be a licensed <laughs> physician. We're now splitting the two right. jobs up uh, and making the other position to be the, the deputy. I don't foresee a scenario where we would hire the person to oversee the operations of the health department mm -hmm. being the licensed physician and the person providing medical advice, public health advice, you know, uh, you know policy ad advice to not be Right. Uh, a licensed physician, and so that's the, the, the rationale uh, behind the change. When we were, for the edification of colleagues, when we were having this broader conversation of how to address this structural question, there were questions of whether or not changes should be made, including whether or not we should adjust that standard. By splitting up the positions, it changed really the dynamics of that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the, the reason why this is being moved forward. Thank you. You've answered my question. Thank you, you've answered my question. I just wanted to make sure everybody was on the same page. Thank you. Uh, so I, I have a question. Um, uh, just to summarize or augment the, the, the question that Councilmember Ludke stated, uh, we are on the verge of splitting up these positions officially. Um, if both were to be held by uh, individuals with PhDs in public policy, uh, public health, would we be out of compliance with state law? Is this, under that scenario, uh, would, would this legislation be required, this amendment? We would likely have to name a physician within Health and Human Services as a, as a deputy health officer to fulfill the role. You, you'd essentially have, potentially have a position where you have two deputies, essentially. But that would, under that limited circumstances in this scenario, that would be what happened. But I would note that right now the position description for the um, for the chief medical officer slash health officer, we actually added to the position description the requirement of it being physician. So this actually would just further qualify it in code. That change actually occurred back in October. Uh, I, I would also, can I just yeah, say one more question? Uh, a, a big part of this conversation was when we were, we had a vacancy in our, our for a very long time. So we were trying to increase our latitude by both splitting positions and changing the medical requirement because we do have physicians and health and human services who could backfill. And so when we were when we were in, in a in a situation where we were uh, trying to find a really good candidate, it obviously made more sense to give us ourselves more latitude. Obviously now that Dr. Davis is on board, uh, th we think this is probably a very unique challenge in the sense that we we're coming off of a pandemic. Um, there, the, the attacks on public health officials were at their height. 
And so I don't think this situation necessarily mirrors itself in future searches. It could. And at that point, there may need to be a different conversation about the latitude. But under the circumstances, we've always believed that the best practice was to have a physician be at the top of the organization. And, and I appreciate uh, how you just framed it, because those are those are the questions that I've been trying to, to grapple with as we approach this, recognizing the incredible hardship that uh, our previous chief health officer experienced while trying to keep our community healthy and safe, the extreme challenge that we faced in trying to find a replacement for Dr. Travis Scales, uh, and not wanting to complicate it any further, recognizing that good good guidance is what we are seeking, right? And here in Montgomery County, uh, one of, if not the most educated places in this country with more graduate degrees than any other place in this country, there are no shortage of individuals with PhDs in public health who I know would be able to enter this role. Uh, but if in fact it is state law that constrains us uh, and uh, places this mandate within the department, then I think it does make sense to, to put that requirement on this one position, and I would support the amendment. Any other comments? Not hearing any. Everybody, uh, those in favor of this amendment, moved by Council Member Friedson, seconded by Council Member Avalanche, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Any other thoughts or amendments by anybody? Is there a motion to move the bill? Uh, moved by Councilmember Friedson, seconded seconded by Councilmember Ludke. Madam Clerk, call the roll. Councilmember Ludke? Yes. Councilmember Mink? Hmm. Councilmember yes. Sales? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Uh, thank you, everybody. Okay. Moving on to the next uh, agenda item, uh, it is an action item on the resolution to approve Executive Regulation 1822, performance-based pay. No. Turn it over to Ms. Wellens. Thank you, Council President Glass. Um, Executive Regulation Number 18-22, Amendments to the Montgomery County Personnel Regulations, Performance-Based Pay. Um, and I would note that uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Fariba Kassiri, as well as Director Anderson, available to answer any questions. We also have um, the Executive Director for the Merit System Protection Board, who's on the line. Normally, you don't have uh, participants virtually, but um, Mr. Martin is on, was on a pre-scheduled leave and so is taking time from his leave to be here to be available to answer your questions. Um, this regulation would um, allow for a performance-based pay not to exceed 25% of base salary for exceptional performance of the, um, the Montgomery County or uh, MCE, no, please forgive me, the MCERP Executive Director for the Montgomery County Employee Retirement Plans. Um, and the executive uh, branch can fill you in, but essentially they conducted a study. They are attempting to recruit for this position. Uh, we're having some difficulties because of the salary level and conducted a study determining that the maximum salary for the position is well below the, the average uh, compensation for an executive director in our area. Um, so again, this would allow just for the um, NCERP executive director for that position to earn a performance-based pay up to 25%. Um, for other comparable MLS positions, the performance-based pay for exceptional performance um, goes up to four to six percent. So this is an increase above that. Happy to try to answer any questions and uh, 
uh, please avail yourselves of your, uh, the expert executive staff as well. I see that, and I see Mr. Martin uh, on the screen. But first, I'm going to turn it over to our GO chair. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Wellens, for that update. Um, you know, uh, this came before uh, the council has an issue uh, before I took over as chair, but I thank uh, Ms. Wellens for answering uh, my questions on this. Uh, you know, as we just discussed prior, uh, you know, looking at these key positions, um, it does look like we are falling behind in salaries in the region and having, um, as folks are regionally, uh, issues with hiring. Um, and as the county exec's office has put this forward, um, you know, this is a factor in recruitment and we want to make sure that we are attracting the best um, to the county to do this work. So again, I want to thank uh, Ms. Wellens for answering my questions and I know uh, my colleague, Council Member Friedson, also um, had a few questions on this and I thank him for also um, following up on this issue. Um, but I do support moving forward with this. Thank you, Council Member Stewart. Uh, Council Member Balcom. Hi, thank you. Um, I understand that we're plopped right in the middle of something that was going on before we got here. Um, so I, I appreciate that I'm entering this discussion at a very late date, but I did want to just express my concerns. And I, I understand that the compensation for this position is not up to market and the problem with recruitment uh, that, that we're having is, is real. And, and I support this amendment. However, I feel I, I agree with what, what I'd read from the um, uh, Merit System Protection Board that it is an imperfect solution. I think that creating a bonus structure for one position that's significantly higher than the other positions is a bad precedent. There may be other positions in the county that are either uh, truly undercompensated or there's a perception of, of the individual holding that position that it's undercompensated and I think that this opens uh, the county up for uh, discord in terms of um, um, this uh, this bonus structure um, so I as I said I will support the amendment but I would ask that the county look at the process of restructuring the position to bring the, pay, the base pay up to market rate. I, I appreciate, I talked with uh, uh, county executive staff this morning and I appreciate the back history of that. Um, so I think that there needs to be a more permanent solution that doesn't have this outsized bonus structure. Um, and then when that does happen, the assumption would be that this bonus structure would go away if, if the position is brought up to market. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to express my concern on that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Uh, good morning. If uh, Ms. Kasiri, could you come, come, on, come on down, please? Mm -hmm. And if you could explain, I, I, I associate myself with the comments of uh, Councilmember Balcom and, and the Merit Protection Board staff that this was unusual. I'm, I think as a concept, performance-based pay is not a bad thing. I think it, it's a fine concept, but it needs to be kind of a holistic approach. So could you talk about, one, the request of the study of this and where you are? I'm assuming you're going to move forward with that. and Or let, let me not put words in your mouth. Are you moving forward with looking at this more holistically as suggested by the Merit System Protection Board? Yes, we will look at it holistically. And and be open to making changes. And then also just address the issue that was raised about just raising the underlying base salary up. What is the where are you at with that? And is that the intention or one of the potential outcomes of this as you look at this? So this position is part of our MLS group, that is the M one highest level uh, merit position in Montgomery County. So per personnel reg, the salary currently is as much, is at 191,765, I believe. So the study may or could raise the cap or the, 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 the cap of the salary, or I think as suggested by MSPB, possibly creating a different unique class just for this one position as merit. So there are, there are a few, few other options, but currently since Per law, we only can offer 
the top that's of M1 salary, that's, that's why we are creating this creative idea of bonus, which is, by the way, is going to be based on performance, and performance of the actually net investment made um, per benchmark and the revenues generated. Are there um, other performance-based merit systems in, in place for the merit system employees? All MLS, they, all their compensation is performance-based, um, and it's already outlined in the personnel reg how the bonuses will be given. Yes, currently we actually have a very structured system of uh, Let me rephrase, I'm sorry. What is the, how, how, just point out the difference between this level of performance oh, based and the other. 6% would be the maximum for currently for MLS right. as, a, as opposed to 25% here? Yes. Okay. So as part of the study, are you going to be looking at the overall performance-based system or just for this position? Um, I, I was going to actually consult with MSPB. Most likely we will just take a more holistic approach. At this point, we believe actually MLS group hasn't been looked has been has not been reviewed for almost I believe maybe 15 years so it may be about time for us to review yeah okay. the MLS code. yeah I would suggest that I think I'm glad you're thinking that but I would strongly suggest you do that I think you should probably look at yes. it holistically and come back and we should all make decisions about everything costs more it's everything's competitive I, I feel like deja vu up here we always are hearing about the in a lot of different departments and fields how hard it's to recruit yes we hear it in with teachers we, you know we're going to work on that we hear it with public safety we hear it you know so i think we need to look at the whole system and then on the other side we also have uh you know every year the list published around the county employees that make the mo most and then we have the, the overtime issues and all that yes. so I, it's just we have a whole set of issues that i think we need to look at so so I would suggest that um, I will support this for, as a you know short-term kind of band-aid fix, but uh, I think we need to. I'm glad you're thinking about that, and yes. please be in touch with us. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, President Glass. Um, so I had a quick question about uh, the communications between the. Merit System Protection Board. Um, I'm glad that we're going to hopefully have a more holistic approach, but I just want to make sure that we're consulting with this um, elected body or appointed body to, um, you know, take their recommendations into consideration. And so, is this? Yes, we are taking their recommendation. I think you mentioned as far as the communication. Mm -hmm. If you're referring to initial uh, delay in the referral, mm -hmm. uh, we take full responsibility. I think OHR, that was just oversight, that it wasn't mm -hmm. referred to MSPB um, on a timely manner. And as far as the review of the MLS category, yes, we are going to do a comprehensive analysis of the current salaries and and what are the reasonable um, salary for all categories in MLS? Yeah, because, you know, as, you know, one of the biggest counties, we want to make sure that we're attracting the best, we're retaining the best and brightest in the region. And so um, I'm glad that this is something we're going to be looking at as costs are rising all over. Um, so thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate that question because joining us via Zoom is Mr. Martin, uh, and uh, I, I would like to invite him into the conversation uh, to hear his thoughts as to how this this resolution is, is affecting his his work. Uh, thank you. Uh, I I'm not sure I have any uh, anything to add. Uh, we, we're mainly uh, willing to answer any questions that, uh, that you might have. Uh, we are, I, I would say that the, uh, the board was um, satisfied that the um, executive branch had, um, you know, uh, obtained uh, time for it to uh, comment on the, on the regulations and, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm sure they'd be pleased to hear today that, uh, uh, that the uh, executive is going to go ahead with uh, appropriate studies to, to do this uh, properly and, and as uh, 
Councilman Juando said, not, not leave the Band-Aid in place. Thank you for, for those comments. Uh, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you. Appreciate the discussion. I agree with much of what has been said. Um, I have asked a lot of questions uh, about this offline. I appreciate the opportunity to have done so and want to thank you, uh, Ms. Kassiri, for your responsiveness uh, to uh, those questions. Um, I think it's important just so everybody understands a few high-level items. First of all, uh, and I share concerns about this is somewhat unprecedented. I share uh, some of the comments about uh, the consistency um, and uh, the process. I'm glad that this was slowed down to a certain degree to allow for the system to address some of those uh, issues. So I appreciate the fact that we're taking this up uh, now and not, not in December. Uh, but the first is, uh, what does this job do and how does it get paid? Uh, because we are in some ways comparing you know, different types of jobs within county governments. I just think it's important, Ms. Kassiri, to explain what does this job do, what does it oversee, what, are the, what is the amount of assets that it oversees, and uh, where does the funding for this job come from? Does it come from tax-supported county government funding, or does it come from other funding? Other funding. This is an $8 billion investment uh, handling all of um, the active and retired employees, about 18,000 active and retired employees. Um, there are um, 26 employees, merit employees, that are um, managing the process. Um, it has two boards, 13 members in one, and I believe 19 in other, and I believe Mrs. Michelson is the chair of the one of those boards. Um, it's basically protecting, investing our employees and our retirees' investment, eight billion. That's a big number. And the study done by the by our consultant. Um, showed, of course, there were some, um, as far as the salary, campaign salary, the amount of the funds that were being handled by each of those other similar jurisdictions, um, the average was about six billion, uh, ours is eight billion, and the average salary for the six billion was about 230 to 240,000. Um, so that is the scope, and then basically that is their, the, the key thing is investment of our Employees act both, both uh, re, re, retire, our retirees and our active employees. So, in the scheme of scope, just so everybody understands, it's about forty thousand dollars up to and a bonus for a position that oversees eight billion dollars in assets. That that's paid out of the eight billion dollars in assets. This is the, this is a, a a position that is paid through the trust. I just think it's important. None of the none of the concerns are illegitimate or different based on that, but I think it's important for the public to understand that. I think it's important uh, for uh, colleagues uh, to understand that. Can you quickly explain what is performance here? Because this is very different than the merit system performance bonuses, which are much more qualitative. That's correct. Uh, based on supervisors' decision. Uh, whereas what is being proposed here is much more quantitative. So can yes. you just quickly explain so, what, uh, what that means? So up to 4% will be same as over MLS, which is qualitative. As far as the quantitative, uh, we actually have based on um, each year the board comes up, they come up with the policy benchmarks. So the compensation will be given based on if the policy benchmark was achieved. And even after that, it is, it's going to be based on CAO's decision after consulting with the board, including considering a variety of factors. But as an example, if the policy benchmark, um, I'm just going to pick, let's say it was um, 46 to 60 point base, and then they, um, um, and based on the investment, they were able to make 32,000, I'm sorry. 32 or close to 33 million. Above that point, this individual will be qualified to receive up to $22,000. So basically, up to 22,000, but the revenue generated in addition would be almost 33 million. The highest that we could be providing to this individual, up to 40,000 is the highest 
that's assuming they're going to make additional 65 million for the county and for the county employees. Yes, I, I think it, I'm Thank just you. glad for understanding of the issue. I think it's important that that be uh, discussed. I did raise previously, and I just want to note that as this is looked at further of whether or not a person in this position should be eligible for both. As this is proposed, they are eligible for both. I think that's something to explore. Whether you know if this is a unique position, whether they you know long term, if changes are made, whether you should you know pick up you know a, a, a system. You know I, I, I'm moving forward and going to support you know this as it is proposed by the executive branch. But I would just note that uh, we've discussed it, and I think it's something to look at. Uh, and I do think that if the broader merit system is looked at uh, in the con uh, context of this uh, issue uh, that performance measures be used similarly. I mean, I think one of the positives here is, and it's much easier in this particular job than in many other jobs, but there are very strict, specific, you know, non-debatable yes. standards that have to be met, uh, not the you know, proximity to a supervisor, the subject, uh, you know, subjective nature of a supervisor's uh, decision, which does create some equity issues that I think we need to be sensitive about. You know, these are, you know, binary questions. You either hit a metric or you don't. And so if we do move forward, you know, with the broader study as you are, which I think is a real positive and is necessary, uh, I hope that we can look at uh, instituting that uh, more. And then the last thing that I will say, and I know there's a commitment to do this, I want to note it for colleagues, uh, we don't get informed enough of the decisions uh, on these. We, we make decisions on the policy, but not on, for instance, whether or not this incumbent performs at a certain level and what their performance bonus is. And I do think that the council on this particular item needs to be informed on an annual basis of what the decision of the CAO Definitely. is based on these performance measures. It can be done confidentially, if appropriate, based on personnel regulations. Uh, and similarly, I think that the uh, the council, as appropriate, should be informed of performance bonuses through the merit system, uh, you know, in an appropriate way. And so, I think we need to work together to figure out. You can anonymize information if that's appropriate. You can do it confidentially if that's more appropriate. But we need to figure out ways for us to do our oversight role and for us to understand how these uh, these bonuses are are being handled. Uh, you know, with a thought on is it being done equitably across. The enterprise, is this being handled appropriately? Is it enough? Is it too much? Is it too little? Uh, I think we need to do that. So I, I know there's a commitment to that. I want to note it for other colleagues because we've talked about that individually in my uh, back and forth. I've you know, discussed some of these uh, questions uh, with the, the GEO chair and uh, look forward to continued conversation about it. I'll put up clarification, Mr. Friedson. You mentioned two, two kind of series of bonuses. 25% is inclusive of the MLS. Yeah, the 25% is the maximum. No, no, already inclusive of that. Right. So basically it's only 21%. Right, right, right. I just, so everybody understand. I, I understand. Thank you for clarifying if I didn't make that clear. 25% is the total. Mm -hmm. That includes 21% of this unique bonus structure that mm -hmm. we're agreeing to today, the 4% that already exists under the merit yes. system. My point was whether or not there should be a quantitative okay. system that has a cap and you're in that system or you're in the more qualitative system that everybody else is eligible for. There is a question of if you're eligible for one, should you be eligible for the other? The 25% was the goal, which you're accomplishing it. The reason that was shared with me, so everybody knows, is if you have a year where the the performance just doesn't do well across the board, everybody is negative. Even if you save the county pension system from you know millions and millions of dollars of losses, you wouldn't be eligible for any bonuses. You know, even if you did a tremendous job saving us millions of dollars, and the question is, should we allow for that to happen? A reasonable point. I think it deserves further discussion as we move forward, you know, more permanently. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure I noted that for colleagues. So I'll go back to you, Mr. President. Thanks for the indulgence. Thank you, Thank you all. Councilmember Albernaz. Thanks. Appreciate very much the thoughtful comments and questions from colleagues on this. Um, I will be supportive of this uh, of this bill, but. Uh, I did have a flashback moment as we were having this conversation because the 15 years ago that Ms. Cassieri was referencing, I believe, um, was in at least in some part, then Councilmember Leventhal was interested in implementing a salary structure for appointed officials um, uh, because there was a concern that uh, the compensation was too high at the time. And there was a study that was done 
and it found that we were very much in line and in some cases below what other jurisdictions were paying. But there was a compromise reached between then County Executive Legate and the Council that there would be a review done every, I believe, two or three years um, of appointed officials, not necessarily MLS. And so I don't know if that's still going on, but there had been a consultant hired to conduct that review so that we could remain competitive but also address the legitimate concerns raised by the council then and this council now uh, that we want to be consistent um, and holistic in our approach and fair uh, to all county employees. So I just lastly want to very much associate myself with the comment that we should be conducting this review across the board more frequently but acknowledge we may not be able to do this in-house uh, to, to be able to be done effectively. So. Uh, this may have to be discussed again at an appropriate time, but we want to do it right um, because we, we do have to remain competitive. The federal government is tremendously struggling right now uh, to recruit highly talented folks, and that is trickling down to governments um, across even our region here in Montgomery County and in the state of Maryland. So something need, we need to be cognizant of. Thank you. The through line between everyone's conversations and comments is that this will be an ongoing discussion for sure. Uh, Councilmember Ludke. And to, to add on to Councilmember Abernaz's um, comments and, and other things that have been said here today, one of the consistent problems we have in government is that we are not as agile as the private sector. Um, and, and we don't have the ability, when we have fixed, rigid structures uh, in place for employment and compensation, particularly at our higher level or where performance-based metrics are, are critical like this, um, the ability to, to compensate and compete appropriately with the private sector. Um, and in this particular arena, in financial management in general, as well as, you know, sort of in the nonprofit world and the development sector of, of nonprofit work, it is my understanding that this is common practice to have these performance-based um, bonuses. So that is something that anyone seeking that type of job or type of work is going to be looking for as a part of their overall compensation package. So that to the extent that that's not available and you say, well, it is not because it is government and we don't do that, that's putting another, you know, strike against the government and being able to compete effectively for recruiting highly talented people to manage, in this case, the, the, the pension system for our, to, to take care of our own, right? Who, who have served this county well. So um, I just wanted to confirm that that is, in fact, the case with you, with Mr. Martin. Um, so yes. Okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Council Member Balcom. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, not clarify, but to reiterate, my concern is not about the compensation. Um, I think that this position uh, must be adequately compensated. We're relying heavily on this individual to, uh, to be the best and the brightest, and, and absolutely we need to pay market rate to attract and retain that position. I think the conversation here today shows the complexity of this, um, of this position and the confusion. And so uh, to me, it, it, it underscores the, the uh, impetus for a potential reclassification. So, so we're not looking at, uh, at that, that it's, this position is not the same as all the other positions in the county, and perhaps it needs to be a separate uh, and to a separate animal in terms of how this individual is compensated, uh, but not um, but not looking at the the same performance based structure. So I really appreciate the conversation that we've had, uh, but I did want to just be on record of saying it's not about the money. We absolutely have to pay uh, what this, this position requires. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hiring flexibility is not typically the strength of government, uh, which is why we are laboring through this conversation, uh, recognizing how important uh, this position is and the work of this position uh, and, and the board. Uh, uh, so with that, uh, Ms. Kasiri, thank you for joining us. Uh, Mr. Martin, thank you for, for zooming in as well. Uh, is there a motion uh, to move this resolution? Moved. Second. Uh, moved by uh, Council Member Stewart, seconded by Council Member Sales. This is a resolution, so it's a hand vote. All those in favor of this resolution, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you.
Okay, now we're going to move to the consent calendar. May I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Moved by Councilmember Jawando. Second. Seconded by Councilmember Sales. All those in favor of the consent calendar, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Okay, we have completed this morning's session. Uh, we're going to come back at 1 o'clock after a uh, recess to honor two proclamations. One is the retirement of Chuck Bean from COG, and the other is a proclamation recognizing Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>